Hi, my name is Rachel Lucky. I'm a dietitian at Freighter Hospital in Milwaukee, and today we're going to be doing a case study on nutrition support in oncology patients. Our patient today is going to be Mr. X. He's a 57-year-old male with a history of head and neck cancer. He's currently undergoing radiation treatments, and he has a planned surgical resection in the future. Um, so Mr. X has been having a hard time eating and drinking lately. He has a lot of painful swallowing and some secretions that make it difficult to eat and drink. Um, he's coming to our clinic for some help today. Um, and our first interventions we're going to try with him are to recommend him doing some soft or pureed foods. And we're also going to teach him how to add um, some calories and protein to that. So he's getting the most for the volume he's eating. So you want to do things like maybe heavy whipping cream, um, some watered down runny peanut butter, powdered milk, anything to add in a little extra calories. Um, we also could recommend some oral nutrition supplement drinks um, to help him with his calorie and protein intake. And lastly, another thing we can try is some lidocaine mouth to maybe numb the area to make swallowing a little less painful. So Mr. X goes home and then about three or four days later, he presents to our emergency room um, because he has been unable to eat or drink or take his pills at all for about um, three or four days. Uh, so given that he can't take anything in, um, the providers and I decided that he should be admitted for a feeding tube placement. Um, so after Mr. X gets admitted, we um, can begin our nutrition assessment with him. And first, we are going to decide what kind of tube placement is most appropriate for Mr. X. When we're deciding what kind of tube a patient should receive, um, we want to look at a couple of things. First, we want to determine how long Mr. X will need nutrition support for. Generally, we can do nasal gastric or nasal jejunal feedings. Um, if a patient is anticipated to need nutrition support for about four weeks or less. We don't want a nasal tube in any longer than four weeks because it can cause some complications like irritation to the throat or even like pressure injuries in the nasal canal. Um, since Mr. X has many more planned treatments and a possible surgery in the future, we're going to recommend that he gets a more permanent tube um, and that is a percutaneous endoscopic um, gastrostomy tube, or more commonly known as a PEG tube or a G tube. And we're going to do a G tube over a J tube because he has a functioning stomach. Um, if Mr. X had any issues with any GI disorder, such as gastroparesis, um, if he had a prior um, gastric surgery that altered his anatomy, or um, if he had any prior tube feeding intolerance in the past, we might want to consider um, jejunal feeding for him. So now that we've established that Mr. X needs a PEG tube, we can start calculating his nutritional needs. Um, the three big components that we'll look at when starting to calculate tube feeding are his calorie, protein, and fluid needs. Um, so to give a little background on Mr. X, he is about five foot seven inches tall and 75 kilograms. And as a reminder, he's 57 years old. Um, there are multiple ways to calculate calorie needs in patients. Um, the current oncology research recommends anywhere between 25 to 35 calories per kilogram. Um, and we can also use other predictive methods such as predictive equations like mifflin St. Gior and things like that. Um, so, but for today, we'll use the calorie per kilogram method. Um, so when using the 25 to 35 calories per kilogram, and we multiply that by 75, that would give us a calorie range of 1,900 to 2,600. After we get our calorie range, we can move on to his protein needs. Um, currently, oncology research recommends between 1 and 1.5 grams per kilogram of protein, and that can always change based on a multitude of factors. Sometimes patients need more protein if they have wounds, if they're on dialysis, or if they're critically ill, we might need to increase that range. But for right now, uh, Mr. X, we can start with his 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram a day. 
And if we multiply that by his weight of 75 kilograms, that gives us a range of 75 to about 110 grams a day. And our third component, the fluid, general recommendations for patients under 65 are about 30 milliliters per kilogram. And so if we multiply 30 by 75, that gives us roughly about 2,200 milliliters a day. So now that we have our three components we need to calculate a tube feeding regimen, we can move on to formula selection. Um, generally, uh, we like to start with a standard polymeric formula and polymeric just means that all the nutrients are in their whole form. Um, formulas are considered hydrolyzed if they have some nutrients partially broken down like fat, for example, to help improve um, absorption or digestion. But because Mr. X doesn't have any issues with prior GI surgeries or intolerances, um, we can go ahead and use a standard polymeric formula um, with fiber. So this formula we're choosing is a 1.5 calorie per, millil per milliliter formula. Um, this formula also contains about 64 grams per liter of protein and is 76% free water. It should also be noted that um, you need about 1,000 milliliters of this formula to meet the DRIs for all vitamins and minerals. So to start calculating uh, Mr. X's tube feeding, we're going to pick a calorie range, just a calorie point to start with. Uh, um, so I'm going to pick 2,200 calories because that's about in the middle of our 1,900 to 2,600 calorie range. Um, and I'm going to take this 2,200 calories and um, divide it by 1.5 calories because that will give us the calories per milliliter. And so that gives us uh, 1,466 milliliters for the day. Um, and if we divide that by 24, because there are 24 hours in the day, um, that gives us 61 milliliters. Um, usually in the hospital setting, we like to use um, numbers um, in increments of five. So we either wanna do 60 or 65 milliliters to give us a nice whole number. So for him, we're gonna pick 60 milliliters. Um, and so if we do 60 milliliters times 24 hours in the day, get, that gives us our new volume of 1,440 milliliters. And if we multiply that by 1.5, because it's a 1.5 calorie per milliliter formula, that gives us um, 2,160 calories for the day, which um, is within our predictive range. To find out how much uh, protein this formula is gonna give Mr. X, um, we'll move on to the next equation. So we know we have um, 1,440 milliliters he's getting each day. And so we'll take 1.44 liters and we will multiply that by 64 because there's 64 grams per liter. And that will give us 92 grams of protein a day. And 92 grams is within our range of about 75 to 110 grams per day of protein. So that's also working well for us. Finally, we'll move on to fluid. So we have 1,440 milliliters a day, and we are going to multiply that by 0.76 because our formula is 76% of free water. And that gives us 1,094 milliliters of free water. Um, we calculated Mr. X's fluid needs to, a, to be about 2,200 milliliters a day. So we need to give him some extra water in the form of water flushes. So to figure out how much um, water flushes he needs, we're gonna take 2,200 and subtract this 1,094 milliliters. And that gives us um, 1,106 milliliters that we need to give him in flushes. Typically with water flushes that um, we use with patients on continuous feedings, we want to give them the flush every four to six hours. And so we're gonna, um, pick a range of giving him a flush every four hours. And so we'll take this 1,106 milliliters and divide that by six because we'll be giving him flushes six times a day. And that gives us a flush volume of 190 milliliters. So now that we have our um, two feeding regimen formulated, we can begin to start to think about how we're going to initiate this two feeding with Mr. X.
Um, there are a few things we want to think about when we're initiating tube feeding, um, and one of those is the potential for refeeding syndrome. Um, refeeding syndrome is a process that occurs in patients that have had prolonged poor oral intake or really high GI losses for a period of time. Um, and when glucose is reintroduced into the um, body, the insulin response to that causes phosphorus and potassium to move from the extracellular space to the intracellular space, which causes a drop in serum electrolyte levels. Um, and along with that, we can see some um, side effects and abnormalities in patients, which is why we want to monitor for that. If you would like to know further on the physiology of refeeding syndrome, the Aspen 2020 consensus paper on refeeding syndrome gets, does a really great job of further explaining the physiology. So given Mr. X has been really struggling with his intake for greater than about four days, we're going to consider him a refeeding risk. Um, and so with that, we're going to take our time to slowly advance our tube feeding or over the course of about two to three days. Um, and we're going to check his phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium levels about every 12 to 24 hours and replete those electrolytes as we see the levels come back. Lastly, we're going to want to provide Mr. X with about 100 milligrams of IV thiamine a day. And that's because um, patients become thiamine deficient when they're in refeeding syndrome because thiamine is a cofactor in a lot of the metabolic processes. So with Mr. X, we're going to do a slow tube feeding initiation. Um, the guidelines for tube feeding initiation vary greatly. In patients that aren't at risk for refeeding syndrome, we can start um, tube feeding usually at 10 to 20 milliliters an hour and advance at anywhere between every four to six hours to our goal rate. Um, with refeeding syndrome, we wanna make sure that we're not giving the patient all of their calorie needs in one day. Um, the recommendations vary greatly for that, anywhere between about um, five calories per kilogram per day to 20 calories per kilogram per day, um, which equates to about 25 to 50% of their nutrition in a day. And we wanna take about two to three days of um, slow advancement of tube feeding to get to the patient's goal rate. So with Mr. X, we're going to start him at 10 milliliters an hour, and we're going to advance by 10 milliliters every 12 hours to our goal rate of 60 milliliters an hour. And that should take us three days to get to his goal rate, which is within our recommendations. So after those three days, we come back and we assess Mr. X and make sure that he's tolerating his tube feeding well. And he is, he's not having any GI distress or fullness. Um, and he's actually um, getting prepared to go home in a few days. Um, so because Mr. X is on continuous feedings, we need to transition him to intermittent or bolus feedings because that's what most closely mimics physiology and will give Mr. X some time off the pump at home. So to transition Mr. X to bolus feedings or intermittent feedings, um, we are first going to take our total daily volume of formula and divide that by the number of formula container volumes. Our total daily formula volume is 1,440 milliliters and our container volume for each container is 237 milliliters. So 1,440 milliliters divided by 237 is 6.07. So we can round that to a total of about six cans. So we will tell Mr. X that he has to have six cans of tube feeding per day. So to create our feeding schedule, we can try to start with two cans three times a day or about 474 milliliters three times a day to mimic a breakfast, lunch, and dinner type schedule. And we also need to create our flush schedule. So Mr. X requires an additional 1,140 milliliters of water per day in the form of his water flushes. And typically we will split the total flush volume by the number of feedings so we'll divide 1,140 by three, which is 380 milliliters. And then we'll flush with half of that volume before and after each feeding, which equates to 190 milliliters of flushes before and after. So with the formula and flushes, this gives us a total volume of about 860 milliliters. And although some patients can tolerate this volume, 
most patients um, best tolerate a total volume of about under 500 milliliters at a time. Um, so with Mr. X, we can either consider spreading out his feedings to three or four feedings a day or spread out his water flushes, meaning he could give himself flushes throughout the day or with medications and not with the three feedings. So if we split his feedings into four feedings, we could advise him to give himself one and a half cans or about 355 milliliters of formula four times a day. And then to modify our flushes, we would advise him to flush with 140 milliliters before and after each feeding. And we got this 140 milliliters uh, by taking our total flush volume again of 1,140, dividing that by eight, um, because we're flushing before and after four times, and that would be 142 milliliters. And then we'll just round down to 140 to give Mr. X an easier number to measure. Um, so our total volume here with the feeding and flushes four times a day is 635 milliliters, which would probably be a little better tolerated. Um, so to get us below that 500 milliliter volume per feeding recommendation, two cans three times a day, um, but decreasing our flush volume to um, 30 milliliters before and after. And then we would have Mr. X give himself another 300 milliliters of flushes three other times throughout the day, or maybe with his medications. Um, so this would bring our total volume for each feeding down to 534 milliliters, um, which might be better tolerated. So just to start um, and see what Mr. X can tolerate, we are gonna choose to start him on 355 milliliters or that one and a half cans four times a day and go with that 140 milliliters before and after each flush and monitor his tolerance. Um, so that's kind of close to our 500 milliliter um, recommendation. Um, and to start him on intermittent, intermittent feedings, there's loose guidelines on how to do that. Um, one way we can do that is by starting with full volume and half rate. And since we're in a hospital, we're going to use a pump for that. Um, when patients get feeding tubes placed in the outpatient setting, um, they can typically just start a feeding with their syringe or gravity bag and just monitor their tolerance to that. Um, so for with Mr. X, we are going to take that 355 milliliters, um, that says one and a half cans, and we are gonna run his feeding at 175 milliliters per hour because that's roughly half of that 355. Um, and so that will take Mr. X about two hours to do an intermittent feeding. So after that first feeding, Mr. X tolerated that well. So for his subsequent feedings while he's here, we are going to run his feedings with that 355 milliliters at 355 milliliters an hour to mimic the speed of a syringe or gravity bag feeding. Um, and so after we get our number of cans, we're going to educate Mr. X and whoever his um, co-learner will be, whoever will be helping him at home. Um, and we're going to explain how to first flush his tube with water, give himself cans, and then flush with water again. We're also going to educate Mr. X on some good hand hygiene um, to make sure he keeps his tube um, nice and clean and also um, educate him on some signs and symptoms when he would need to um, call the clinic or his provider um, if he were having some complications like a clogged tube or if the tube's popping out a little bit. So overall, Mr. X had a very successful admission. He tolerated continuous feedings well. We transitioned him to intermittent feedings that were very well tolerated and we got him all set and educated to go home on tube feedings. So that concludes our case study on oncology and nutrition support for today. Um, please stay tuned for further case studies in the future on different um, disease states. Uh, and please leave any comments or questions in the comment section below. Thank you. Mm -hmm.